Welcome to the webinar. This is Brian. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and you can see my screen. You can type into the, the chat box and let me know if you can see everything and hear everything okay. Just trying to verify everyone can hear me. Before I get going here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and you can see the screen. Welcome to the Lean and Six Sigma and the Environment webinar. Um, the objective is to give you an overview of this topic and get you familiar with um, some of the concepts and some of the research I've done over the last few years and give you a little bit of background on myself to see um, why I'm picking this topic and why I think it's a very important uh, topic for us to be focused on and looking at in our companies and any groups that we work with. So this is the agenda for today. We're going to go through, um, again, I'll briefly just tell you who I am, and then we'll talk about the seven forms of waste you might be familiar with. We'll talk about gamble walks, talk about um, utilizing Six Sigma projects to reduce electricity usage. We'll talk about tools to incorporate, uh, existing Lean and Six Sigma tools we can incorporate into um, our application for improving the environment. We'll look at ways to um, reduce the environmental impacts uh, that don't nat naturally get done through process improvements. We'll also talk about environment safety and health and facility resources and how we can utilize them. And we'll kind of wrap up with um, some ways that uh, Lean and Six Sigma can help you go beyond just uh, addressing easy and low-hanging fruit type of options. Uh, my name is Brian Hurley. I was uh, born in Iowa City. I have a bachelor's degree in statistics and a master's in quality management. 
So that's what got me started down my path of Lean and Six Sigma. Um, been working at Rockwell Collins for many years now and in the Lean and Six Sigma role. Um, I got my black belt certification from ASQ and through Rockwell Collins, I got a Lean Master certification. I'm currently living in Portland, Oregon. So that's where a lot of the um, connection with uh, Lean and Six Sigma and the environment has taken root over the years. One of the first things I'll, I'll point you to is, is case studies. And on our uh, the website, Lean Six Sigma Environment.org, which is the website I run, I've got a couple different documents you can access and download. Um, the first one is just uh, some an explanation of eight different uh, companies that have applied Lean and Six Sigma tools, such as value stream mapping or Gemba Walks um, or statistical analysis to address environmental issues. Eight different examples there in a um, couple page document. So it's a good reference to show people, hey, these, this, these tools work and you can actually make a difference. So let's get started with um, what a lot of people might be familiar with is the seven forms of waste. Or sometimes you have eight forms of waste or 10 forms of waste, but traditionally there's either seven or eight forms of waste that get mentioned. Um, the acronym I, I think is very helpful is called Tim Wood. It um, stands for transportation, inventory, motion, and then waiting, overprocessing, overproduction, and defects. So as, as you're doing process improvements, one of the things you're looking for is um, how do these tools, or how do we identify these wastes and use Lean and Six Sigma tools to uh, solve those wastes? So naturally, as you're looking into uh, process improvement, you're gonna be um, able to see these opportunities, and uh, those are the flags that say, we might have problems here. As you look at those seven forms of waste, if you look at the environmental impact of those wastes, you can actually see um, how they have an impact. So overproduction, that leads to obviously more materials that are being produced that may or may not be consumed at a later time. Well, that can lead to extra products that may end up being, may spoil or become obsolete in the future. And then we have to dispose of those items. So that would be an environmental impact from the overproduction. Inventory is another one to when we produce inventory from either overproduction or we buy more than we need Then that has to be stored those that inventory has to be stored and protected so that it increases the amount of packaging and That room that you're going to store it in takes up floor space. See that's um, Floor space that could have been used and or we could avoid renting out more space um, And you have to heat cool and light that that space. So that has an impact on the environment Transportation and excessive motion. Those are, um, when we're moving things around, we usually have to put them in a container or package them up, and that's extra waste. That also adds time to our processes by, by doing that. So when we cut down the transportation, we can um, reduce a lot of that time and a lot of the materials that go along with it. When we have defects, we have um, defective components that we have to do something with, and oftentimes, We'll have to dispose of them. We can't necessarily recycle everything. So that's, a, that's an impact. Or if we're just waiting. So we have, um, we're waiting for things to get processed. We're waiting for things to um, get completed. The potential for the material to spoil or while we're waiting, we're, we're putting it on a shelf somewhere. It can get damaged. Someone can walk by and, and hit it or place another part or or device nearby it and it can cause damage, then we have to handle that in a different way. So as we look at the seven forms of waste, there is an environmental impact that goes along with each of these. And so we wanna start thinking about how do we capture that and start identifying those additional wastes. So it really gives us a, an opportunity to highlight and identify um, more of the waste that is going on and capture the full business case. And that can help you sell some of the improvements you're trying to make when you look at all these extra environmental impacts as well. 
So I, I, I got this um, diagram um, or the, the WASTE acronym I thought was pretty good. I took a class from uh, um, Purdue, University of Purdue or Purdue University uh, Extension Program. And they had uh, this acronym and I thought it was a good way of, of looking at your company or any group that you're working with and trying to figure out what are the, what of these impacts that do they um, most have a influence on? So W stands for water, A stands for air emissions, S would be solid waste or trash, T would be toxins or hazardous material, and E would be energy. So as you're starting that discussion with uh, your company or your organization, you can start to break down their utility costs and say, where are you guys spending the most amount of money or where do you have the biggest impact of those five groups? And those are easy to remember. So you can think about waste and then you can think about those those five categories. So <clears throat> one of the key themes around lean is a, a gimbal walk or what we'll call a waste walk and where we uh, go through the structure process to identify those uh, environmental impacts and we go and see and we go look to see where is that waste happening. Um, it's also called um, treasure hunts, I've heard, or um, we'll talk about another one called the dumpster dive. It's the same concept. We're not just looking at a spreadsheet or looking at the utility bill, but we're actually looking physically at the waste coming out of the processes. And we're trying to um, figure out with the people who deal with it and handle it all the time, what's going on. So the three primary areas where I've seen this applied in the, in the WASTE acronym is by looking for water opportunities, and we'll call that a water walk. When we're trying to reduce um, trash or landfill, that'll be solid waste, and that could be called a dumpster dive. And the third one would be uh, energy reduction, so we'll call that an energy walk. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on the energy walk here. GE, there's a case study in the EPA where they've got, um, they put together a couple of case studies and a couple of toolkits. So I'll, I'll share that with you uh, at the end of this, uh, where the links are. They um, got a hold of a General Electric, or GE, who had done a, a pretty big lean and in, in energy initiative where they had identified uh, $110 million in potential energy savings through these energy treasure hunts. Um, so they conducted like 200 of them, and they involved 3,500 employees and found uh, 5,000 Kaizen projects they could do. And um, it doesn't go through and say exactly how many of those got implemented, but uh, the ability to identify and see all those opportunities um, was tremendous using this approach. And so we'll talk through a, a very similar approach here. So there's a walk process um, I tried to put together to help explain the steps that you're going through. So the first step would be prepare, that you've got a business case, you know, you're looking at the costs, you're looking at the impact, you're trying to figure out why would we be working on this particular waste stream uh, compared to other ones. Next, we would try to scope, uh, scope out the area or location that we're gonna focus in on the walk. So, um, you have a large building, you break it down into a certain department or a certain area where you think a lot of it's coming from, and that would be your, your focus for the activity, at least to get started. Then we put together a schedule. It says, when are we gonna do these activities? When are we gonna do the planning? When are we going to have the event? When are we gonna have the follow-up? Um, and then is there a larger plan to go to other areas and departments? And then we'll have a, um, a final kind of review, we'll get all the team members together and say, this is the plan, this is what we're trying to accomplish. And does everybody buy in? Is there concerns? Can you make the dates? Are you available? And if so, then basically we close out this planning worksheet, sometimes called a charter form, but basically getting everyone on board, the management on board, the workers in involved, making sure they got approval for the time to come in at different hours. And we'll, we'll go into that detail here next. But basically just getting buy-in for this activity. Then the next stage is to actually conduct the event. Well, we'll go through different, um, basically we'll observe the processes at different times of day and interview the people who are in that process to find out why are these things happening? 
is there opportunities to improve it or reduce the impact? Third, we'll get down and actually take all these ideas and opportunities and put them together into affinity diagram or try to group them into similar like-minded ideas. And then finally, we'll take and try to rank these ideas to figure out which ones are gonna have the most impact and are gonna be the easiest to implement. Some things are gonna be very expensive and costly, other things are gonna be simpler. Then we'll select just the top three opportunities through some kind of a, a voting exercise with the team. And those are the items that we're gonna go off and actually uh, pursue. And some people like to take on more than what they can really handle. So we try to limit it to just three. So during the um, particular energy walk, and, and this, this format is very similar, to, similar for the other walk events as well. But basically we go through and look for uh, look and make observations at four different times. The first one would be off shift. So usually we start off on a weekend and we'll go in and people typically aren't working. So we have a, a lot of that are powered down hopefully, but a lot of things that are left open or left on, we can mark and, and, and write down that, hey, these things are being left on and no one's here working on them. So uh, that's usually uh, where a lot of the big opportunities are identified when nobody's working. And we have equipment on, we have lights on, we have fans running, we have um, ovens on, you know, um, space heaters. Lots of those things are opportunities to shut off and turn off. Then the next phase we'll come in and look at is when the startup occurs. So when people come in for the beginning of the shift, um, maybe over the evening um, at 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. in the morning, we might have uh, the first people coming through and they show up to work and they start turning on equipment, they get logged into computers, they uh, put on their, their um, protective equipment, whatever their task is, we're observing what's going on in the, in the startup. Are, are people sh turning things on when they need it or when they just show up? Are all the lights coming on even though only one person's there? Those are the types of things we're observing. During the working time, we'll um, see what happens during breaks or you know, when um, people go away from their area. Do, does the equipment get left on? Does it go into a standby mode? Uh, what happens? And then finally, when people leave at the end of their shift, what is the process? Do people shut down the equipment or do they leave it up? And it, or if it's just a transfer of shift, what happens there? Are there opportunities that we can identify? So what we'll do is we'll take a mix of people. Um, some are knowledgeable of the area, some are, are completely uh, new to the area. So we have a mix of process experts, technical experts, people with a fresh set of eyes who have no experience at all, and even different levels of the organi organization. So people who work in the area all the way up to um, top, ma top level management. And we break them into smaller teams and they go off and look at different parts of the area, depending on the size of the area they have. So that's one uh, a simple way of getting started. Another way is uh, to go at it more of a structured Six Sigma approach where we identify a cost issue, in this case, electricity spend is too high. And we go through the DMAIC model from Six Sigma and walk through and look at the data and see if the data can help us identify what's happening. So we use regression analysis for um, doing a lot of modeling of electricity data. So what I've got here on the, on the slide is a picture of energy usage by month. And that's in kilowatt hours. And you can see there's a pattern to that, that in the um, summer months, we've got higher usage. And then in the winter months, it's a um, lot less. And that makes sense. And if this is electricity and we have uh, a hot climate during these months, then we're gonna be spending more money to cool the building. But we wanna be able to model that out first. So one of the first things we'll do is say, well, what are the variables or inputs to the kilowatt hours usage? And can we model that into our, our diagram here? So the first thing we did is grabbed all the, uh, the average temperature for each month, and we put that on um, the same spreadsheet. And then we did a regression to see 
does the temperature outside for that month match up with the utility usage? And so when we put that model together, you can see that the red line is the predicted usage of, of energy based on just the outside temperature. The black line is the actual usage of energy. And so it starts to fit the data pretty close, but there's a lot of situations where it doesn't quite fit as closely as we'd like. And the, the, on the far right, we have a, a R square value. That means that about 30% of the variation in the, the usage each month, each month is coming from the temperature. So that means we have another 60 to 70% that we, um, is coming from other factors and other variables. So we can do better. And let's, let's see what happens when we add other, factor, uh, ac other variables to this model. So there's actually, it was eight or 10 different variables that we started with. And when we broke it down, these are the three that end up being uh, most important. So we had the, the temperature and that was very important. We also had the number of employees each month. So as we, um, as the change in number of employees um, fluctuated month to month, we could also see a change um, in the electricity. And so that had some influence on our, our results. The other thing that was on there is called spares output quantity. Basically that was a, a measure of uh, production on spare parts. And so as we built and produced more spare parts, then that had an impact on our, our electricity usage. So that, that might seem somewhat intuitive that we have more people, we're, we're building more product and the temperature is changing outside. That would affect our utility, or, or sorry, our electricity usage. But the question is, well, what can we do about it now? We can't really control the temperature outside, right? What we could do is we could um, look at what happens to the building when the temperature outside changes. Well, we have heating and cooling equipment that runs. So basically what this model is telling us is we should probably look at the heating and cooling equipment to see if there's opportunities to improve that because it is very um, sensitive to the outside temperatures. So that's how we would interpret this, this model is in, in terms of what we would go pursue or dig into. And that was the case in the situation for this facility. It was very large. We had really no idea where to start. And this model gave us some starting points. Um, on the output side, obviously we don't want to reduce our production output, that would um, mean we would have less sales and, and we don't necessarily want to, want to do that, but we could look at what is the equipment and what is the processes that are happening when we're making these spare parts. And let's uh, dig into that area to see if there's uh, energy usage or electricity usage that there, where there's some opportunity to improve on that. And finally, the employees, again, we don't want to uh, reduce the number of employees but we could look at what is the employee behaviors that are driving the electricity usage. And so that would um, allow us to pursue and look into the, the things that the employees do from shutting down their computers and monitors to uh, personal um, devices like fans and space heaters and things like that. And then the number down here, now we're up to 75% of the variation is understood by the model. And you can see the red line and the black line fit a lot closer. So we have a pretty strong model and we have some areas we can go focus. So that's an, uh, an example of how you could use more of an ana analytical approach to identify opportunities and areas to pursue deeper. So if we combine those last two approaches with the go and see or the waste walk, with this regression analysis, then we could go and look at, do a uh, energy walk around the um, heating and cooling equipment and do an energy walk with the office areas where the employees work. If you're familiar with uh, Lean, you're, you have probably run across the value stream mapping tool. So here's an example of a value stream map. One thing you can do to uh, incorporate the environment into this is through the metrics box or the data box. So in this example, this is also out of the uh, EPA website, and I can send a link to that as well. They have actually captured the water usage at each of those steps. 
And then, so now we can bring some visibility to what's going on. So you could, it could be the electricity usage at that phase. It could be the um, uh, air emissions. It could be how much uh, material is being produced, how much uh, is going to recycling or into the landfill. Whatever focus you want, just put that into the data box of your value stream map. So that's one approach with, um, um, as a way to incorporate the environment into existing lean tools. The other approach would be to, um, instead of the traditional timeline that shows the, the lead time and the actual cycle time of each process, so in the first box of milling, it's a five-day lead time and the process takes two minutes per item. What they've done is either they've put, gone and put in a timeline that has to do with um, materials. So they use 120 pounds of materials, but only 80 pounds of material uh, get consumed. So there's a missing 40 pounds that gets thrown away or recycled. It tells us there's maybe some opportunities to look at what are we throwing away and can we either reduce this 120 pounds down to five pounds or can we increase the efficiency of that material so that more of it moves along so that 80 pounds becomes 115 or 120 pounds. So by mapping out the actual usage as another timeline on the value stream map, that's, an, that's another way to uh, identify opportunities and bring these problems to light. Another tool is called the QDIP, um, or SQDC is another term, but basically it's a visual depiction of key metrics in your area. And you use a very simple green and red color code system. Under each, um, what defines each color is whether you get a green or a red is, is if you meet each of the goals that are listed here. So for safety, if you have no missed days that day for safety and no injuries, then you get a green. If there was an incident or something happened, then it would be a red. Same with quality. If you had less than five defects that day and your defects per million opportunities was less than 50 overall and your test yields were greater than, let's say, 95%, then you'd get a green for that day. And so each box on each letter represents a day of the month. And what you could do is create one for the environment. And this is just an, um, an example. You can modify the criteria for whatever you want, but you could say, if all is all the equipment shut off at the end of the shift? So someone could go through in the morning or at, at the end of the shift and say, yep, everybody shut off the, the equipment that we defined needed to be shut off. Shut off. You could check the trash cans and make sure that there wasn't any recyclables or things that shouldn't have been in the trash that were in there. And you can make sure that all the um, process adherence to hazardous waste was followed. And if all those criteria were met, then the team would get a green in that day of the month. And if they did not meet one of the criteria, then you'd have a red there. And then the team at the their stand up meetings or their huddles would talk through what happened. If you're familiar with the failure modes and effects analysis, um, one thing you could do is when we start looking at severity of problems as part of the ranking system that goes along with the FMEA, usually we're talking about the failure of the product or the failure of the process to uh, meet customer ex expectations. But one thing we could do to um, enhance the severity category is to include things like uh, injury or deaths as a result of um, environmental impacts or risks. So you could have things like chemical spills or radiation exposure or release of chemicals into the environment. That would be additional criteria that would help people determine if they're, what the risk is or identify that, yeah, we actually, not only would that fail, but it actually would release chemicals in this, at the same time. Or you have things that are, um, a little bit minor, but um, you know, people are exposed to some hazardous material. And so what it's basically doing is allowing us to incorporate that risk into the FMEA analysis. So you can get more details at that link below. Another tool that's pretty commonly used is called the SIPOC. It stands for Supplier, Inputs, Process, Outputs, and Customer. What you're doing is we use this as a scoping tool to try to figure out who should be involved in some of our events or activities. So we start with mapping a process out 
identifying the major steps. So this one would be a community recycling. You know, the you as a consumer, you go purchase an item, you remove the packaging, you sort the the waste into certain recycling bins. Hopefully, hopefully if you have that, the bins get collected up and then the contents of the bins get dropped off to different locations. Um, some go to landfill, some go to recycling centers. And then you'd identify what are the inputs and the outputs for that process. Inputs are all the things that go into purchasing and packaging and the, the waste bins and information that people need to be able to do this process correctly. So they need to go to the city website to get the criteria for what is recyclable and what's not. Um, when they're purchasing items, they're buying gifts and food and drink and household items and tools. And then on the output side, you have trash, recycled items, maybe compost dirt, greenhouse gas emissions, and lechet, um, what comes out of the landfill. So, and then we go from the next step of outputs is figure out who are the customers or who deal with that output. Well, the landfill does, the residents community have an impact, and so does the environment. And so what we're uh, recommending is to include uh, the voice of the environment into this customer category to make sure that we're considering the impact on the environment, stuff like greenhouse gas emissions and lechet. That has an impact on the environment and the community, but we wanna make sure that voice is represented in this map. One thing you can do from here would be to um, figure out who is a good person to have on the event or on the team that can um, convey that voice. And maybe it's someone who works in a nonprofit organization in the community, or maybe it's your ESNH person who can be that representative to make sure that it's getting an equal voice in our decision making and our uh, improvement activities. So one of the problems that come up comes up is well, if we have a process improvement uh, methodology already or a continuous improvement program, wouldn't you know our environmental impacts get addressed already? And we mentioned before that if you reduce some of your seven forms of waste, you will help reduce some of the environmental impact. So there is some automatic improvement that takes place. However, when we look at a improvements, we're usually focused on the, the process in red here. That is the actual you know, value stream for the customer, um, the product or service that you're providing to your customer. So in this example, it goes to the warehouse, we prepare the materials, we put it through some machinery, and we do some assembly work, we test and inspect it, we package it, and we ship it out. So a lot of the effort is focused around those activities. But around and in, in supporting those processes are a lot of the environmental stuff like the lighting and the heating and cooling and the chemical management and the, elect the electricity and the fuel for shipping parts around and product around. And those don't necessarily, they impact those processes, but they're not direct. So what we often do is we don't see these opportunities when we're evaluating the main process. Because they're sometimes outside of view, they're sometimes unknown, they're not um, isolated down for that specific product. So they're, they're hard to see and they often get overlooked. And so what we're trying to um, say here is that when you go and you actually focus on these areas, then you can actually make a big dent in those problems, but they won't nat naturally get incorporated into your existing activities unless someone's there kind of pushing that along and making sure that gets addressed. So there's a lot of value on, in just stepping out and focusing directly on these support processes and, and infrastructure things that are important. So, um, so that's that's part of it. Um, some other comments I'll make: improvement opportunities can sometimes be found outside of working hours. So, with the lean approach, we go and see. Well, usually we're we're going and seeing when the work is being done, but a lot of the opportunities are outside of work when work's not being done, like leaving things on. Um, so, we have to use these go and see events where we're going at different times a day to pick that up, and that's not naturally done all the time. We also have the, the sometimes people say that's just the cost of doing business. You know, I got an electric bill, that's what it's gonna cost. There's nothing I can really do about it. 
or my part is so small in the percentage that I'd be a lot of work for me to, to focus on. I got bigger problems to deal with. So it just gets overwhelmed um, in, the, in the bigger problems and issues going on in the business. And when I break it down into an individual process area, let's say I'm looking at a specific piece of equipment and I'm trying to measure the electricity usage, those numbers don't uh, don't get into hundreds of and thousands of dollars. It's usually in the, you know, very small numbers on individual equipment and device. And so it um, it's hard to see and raise those problems up from a financial impact. But if we look at it across the whole facility and the whole business and the whole organization, then you actually see there's big opportunities there. And a lot of times the, the people who are utilizing the utilities, like they're utilizing the, the electricity or they're um, generating the most solid waste, they're not paying equally for that usage. So usually the um, companies will blanket the cost based on a square footage calculation, not an actual usage calculation. So they say, well, how many employees do you have in your area? Well, everybody's just gonna get a blanket cost of X dollars per employee. Or how much square footage you have, we're gonna just charge you a certain dollar per square foot to cover these overhead costs. And so two different groups could be paying the same amount with the same space, but one is using twice as much energy and generating twice as much trash. And so there's no incentive for those groups because the data isn't broken out in that granularity. So if they did make some improvements, it wouldn't actually change their bill that much. And so we're not isolating the data to the right users. We also, from a lean perspective, aren't necessarily looking at the content of the materials. We're looking at flow of materials, we're looking at defects, but we're not necessarily saying, well, why are we using those, that particular uh, material? Couldn't we use a recycled material? Or couldn't we use a cleaner energy source? Those aren't necessarily questions that get brought up in a process improvement activity. We're usually just looking at bringing in the right amount of it and just in time, not what is the um, actual um, eco-friendliness of that material. We also don't have a way of capturing externality costs, and those are the costs and impacts that happen in the community or in the environment that our businesses and organizations are generating and causing, but they're not actually paying for it. So things like pollution, actually have an impact on the community in terms of healthcare costs. But is that cost being reassigned back to the polluters themselves? And oftentimes that's not the case. So the financial incentive for the company uh, isn't there because they're not seeing the, the bill for that. And there's some benefits when, when you put in place things like a take back program or when you're attracting more employees to your organization because of the, your green efforts, or your employees are staying around longer with the company because they like the, the mission and the thing, good things that the company's doing, or they're more engaged while they're being employed there. Those things are hard to quantify, but there definitely are strong benefits for doing those things from, um, from a business perspective. But it's hard to quantify that, hey, spending money on this um, and making our business more green is gonna have a financial and uh, customer satisfaction improvement. So uh, those are hard to quantify, and so it's people are hesitant to jump in and do those. Um, but there's definitely evidence to support that those things do happen when you have a, a good program. So one way we can overcome this is we, if you have an environment safety and health organization is to continue the effort where they're they're working with individuals and people on safety issues and health issues and say and. Uh, um, accidents, they're already interacting with the workers, continue that effort through these go and see events. Um, educating the employees around turning off equipment, how to recycle and compost properly, how to handle hazardous waste in an efficient way, how to look for waste, uh, sorry, water conservation improvements and reduce air leaks. Those are things that the ESNH group is already involved in, in with the people doing and they can continue and expand by incorporating these other areas. From the facilities perspective, they're more of the top-down approach. They're looking at the whole building infrastructure. And so they can pursue things like the renewable energy, whether they're you're getting um, solar panels or, or wind turbine on site, or if you're buying 
uh, renewable en energy credits, looking at efficiency upgrades with heating and cooling equipment or lighting LED upgrades, greening the cafeteria, so getting better, more local food in, um, reusable plates and, and silverware, uh, compost stations, those types of things, putting in electric car charging stations, uh, making the buildings more uh, closer to uh, the lead criteria so that they're more uh, greener and they have uh, bike parking and showers for bikers and close to public transportation. So that could be for new buildings or existing buildings. But if you take a top-down approach with the facility group and a bottoms-up approach with the ESNH group, you can really kind of meet at the middle with um, the Lean and Six Sigma approach to help both those groups um, make improvements. And then you have kind of a, a fuller picture of your um, sustainability effort. And you can really get a lot of momentum going. So if you, you take it from bottoms up and a top down approach, um, that can be pretty effective. As you're going through um, your process improvement events, one recommendation is to invite your ESNH and your facility personnel to those events. There's a lot of things that can go on where, and they're often left out of these events. People kind of just forget that they have a, a lot to say and a lot of influence on what changes can be made. And when we're doing lean events, we definitely want to re uh, lay out areas and move things around. And so they, they need to be involved as well, but that can cause permitting issues um, for ESNH. So if you can't get them to attend the event, then one thing you do is use this checklist that the EPA put out. And it's a questionnaire that you can go through and say, do we, are we going to Im impact any of these things that, uh, where we need to at least on, have someone on call to come in and help us answer those questions before we get too far along in our event? Because nothing will derail your event more than uh, you get a plan together and you go out and find out you can't do it, or um, there, you don't have the resources to be able to do that. So there's a couple of checks, um, a couple of questions about the physical environment. Um, material and chemical usage and storage, and then around waste management. So kind of wrap up here. Um, the first strategy, or there's multiple strategies to, to take on, but first thing would be to focus improvement efforts specifically on your social or environmental metrics. So look at your electricity usage, look at your solid waste cost, um, and, and focus improvement efforts around that so you so it gets the attention it needs second would be to um, tie back your environmental and social issues into your core business so maybe solar panels make sense for your company but if, it, if you can't make a connection between the work that the, the company does and solar panels maybe that's not the right thing to pursue maybe your company is um, has better um, knowledge around geothermal and so maybe that's a better uh, opportunity or um, chilled water systems. Look at what your business does and then align this, the environmental improvements to what the business does so it doesn't look like it's just a one-off thing that really has no connection. So look at the costs, look at risks, look at your company reputation and try to figure out what aligns with us really well. Um, so don't just do things because it, it might look good, but uh, if you can tie it and say this is actually going to help us as a company be a better company and help us in the long run, then you've, then you've got buy-in from all levels of management. Uh, the next thing you want to do is actually um, when you're conducting events is to make sure you're doing them in a green way. So when you do a 5S, make sure that you've got um, different, um, the, the proper recycling setup. When you conduct lean events, make sure you've got your, um, uh, the, your ordering food, and you're not over ordering food, you're using reusable plates and silverware, uh, you're picking a meeting room that can has, that has more natural lighting and have um, you know, uh, reusable napkins, those types of things, so that you're not generating a lot of waste and um, not being green in your events. Another thing you could do is start a green team and get your ESNH and facilities team involved along with any Lean and Six Sigma personnel and just get the dialogue going with your employees. And then you can also uh, share this slide and some of the handouts I'll, I'll show you at the end here. 
share that with your uh, facilities, ESNH, and your Lean and Six Sigma personnel and get them, get that dialogue going that, hey, there's a lot we can do to move our company forward. And then on the tool side, uh, we talked about this in the presentation, but to add earth or environment as a customer on your SIPOC diagrams, uh, to add an environmental usage and cost into the data boxes on the value stream map, or you can also add it in the timeline. So I showed two examples there. Um, when you have training material on seven forms of waste, incorporate the environmental impacts into the seven forms of waste, seven forms of waste definitions. If you have an internal website, uh, make sure that those are connected and included in there. And then uh, we showed the checklist. So if you can't get your in environment safety and health people or facilities people involved in the event, then bring up this checklist. And, and that might tell you that we need to call that person in now before we get too far along. Okay, so that was kind of a, an overview of, of how, I, how I think about Lean Six Sigma and the environment. There's a couple other things that um, are available on the website I want to highlight for you. Free guides for you to uh, kind of go into a little bit more detail, screening your lean events. So I'll go through and list out some ways you can make your events and meetings uh, a little more greener. Another one is 10 tips for greening your 5S event. So we'll go through and kind of explain ways to um, make reduce a lot of the solid waste that goes to landfill from those events. There's also, uh, at the beginning, I showed you the eight ways to reduce uh, environmental impacts, those eight case studies. But there's actually another document that's got 40 or more case studies. So we just highlighted eight of them in that document. But there's 40 plus that we've dug up uh, around the web and uh, a few of them that I've worked on myself. So those are other reference documents that you can share and, and download from the website. The other one is there's a, a Waste Walks course that we put together. Um, there's a free video on the website that talks through specifically water walks. And it goes into that process I showed in a little more detail. And that's available to just download and watch. There's also an audio available for the whole course. And that's for free on the Earth Consultant podcast. So if you want to just listen to the audio part, that's free. If you want to watch the video itself with the audio, then um, it's, it's available through Udemy.com. I think it's $20. So it's very inexpensive. And it's probably about um, 30 to 60 minutes of content. If you have any questions or you'd like to chat about where you're at and recommendations on how to proceed forward, I'd love to talk to you. So feel free to email me or set up a call with me and give you uh, access to see what times I have available. And then there's also a class that we've been putting, I've been putting together over the last year or so. I usually have it about twice a year. Um, so the next one's coming up next month. And there's a one-day class and then a two-day class. So the one day is um, obviously we cover less content, but we go through the same material. It's just we don't get into the details as much. The two-day class is a little bit more detailed. So in mid-June, there's a class coming up and then another one in uh, early November. And so either class is an option if you're interested in, in learning more there. So that's all I had to, for today. Um, Thank you for joining. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can go to the Lean Six Sigma Environment.org website and um, you'll find my contact information. You'll find the, the free downloads. You'll find lots of articles and videos we've uh, gathered up and collected. Um, and hopefully, it can help you move your company or organization towards um, more environmental improvements. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to add those into the chat box. And if you don't have any questions, then um, thank you for, for joining. And um, I'll hopefully talk to you soon someday.